What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the godless engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. This is going to be a clip from one of my Did Jesus Exist live streams where I took calls from people in the audience. Today, we're going to have a friendly conversation with Bill. Bill is uh, from the Atheist and Christian Book Club, which I will have linked down in the description. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, source reliability and the origins of the gospel. We'll also be talking about Paul uh, discussing James, the brother of the Lord, and whether or not that's a fictive kinship or a blood relationship. We'll also be discussing some of the methodology generally surrounding the historical Jesus. So if you want to fuck around and find out all of this great information we're covering today, then please stay tuned. We're going to get to our next caller. What up there, caller? How you doing? Hey, pretty good. Boy, I didn't know you had a show. Wow. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, where do you know me from? I've posted like almost everywhere. Uh, I know Godless Granny, and uh, I watched her interview with uh, Richard Carrier. Oh, okay, cool. How'd you like it? So I, tech, I, I love Richard Carrier. I love David Fitzgerald, who we interviewed. We have a book club, the Atheist Christian Book Club, and we've had all these guys on Robert Price also. Um, so I asked her, do you know what the four source hypothesis is? Do you know what the four source hypothesis is? Yeah, I believe that's, uh, the one that includes like, uh, the gospel of Mark as one of the founding like gospels or narratives. And then there's Q and then there's M and there's L, right? Is that the four source? <laughs> well <Huh>? done. <laughs> so, exactly. Good, good. Uh, so you have, um, you know, Mark. And then you have Q, the two source hypothesis, but you can go and expand that to where Matthew has his special source and Luke has his special source. And this is a very hotly debated topic. Uh, Mark Goodacre out of Duke does not believe in Q. So you've got some really good scholars that don't. However, if you read uh, Dale Allison and Bart Ehrm and their apocalyptic books about the apocalyptic Jesus, they both came to the same conclusion that Jesus is best understood as an apocalyptic prophet that had a bad weekend in Jerusalem. But they constantly talk about Q, different levels of Q. And you have things in Matthew and Luke, like uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the uh, Lord's Prayer, that are not found in Mark. So they came from somewhere. So to me, that's a fair evidence that we might have some multiple attestation going on. Well, can I, can I push sense? back a little bit here? Sure. Okay, so where, where I come at from this is that I need to, just my analytical engineer brain, right? I need to be able to distinguish between them, um, you know, independently coming from a different source, you know, and, and uh, writing these things and just like making them up like Matthew making something up and then that made something up appears in Luke because there are a few stories in Luke that actually uh, Luke prefers uh, Matthew's version to Mark's version. Exactly. Now, let me give you another example. In Mark, Mark records Jesus walking on the water. But if you look at Matthew, Matthew adds Peter walking on the water. So there you go where you have Matthew correcting Mark and actually, you know, it doesn't look like he has his own eyewitness account that he's just uh, making, for whatever reason, making Mark different by having Peter walk on the water. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? No, yeah, I get so it. So another reason, let's go to uh, what, when uh, Richard Carrier debated Craig Evans of Houston, a conservative biblical scholar. And by the way, I'm an atheist, okay? Okay. So what he went to, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I hated that debate. Not, not, I carry your degrade in the debate. What I hated about the debate was the fact that uh, Craig Evans seemed to just literally not even consider Carrier's position. And so, like, when Craig uh, started off his debate and made his arguments and everything like that, the fact that he just totally ignores everything that Carrier is saying and all the evidence that Carrier lays out, I feel like that automatically like makes him lose the debate because he doesn't actually respond to anything that Carrier says. Yeah, and that's not right. But uh, what he went to and what Bart Ehrman goes to is Galatians 1, 18 through 20, where it says Jesus met uh, his brother, James, obviously, and his closest disciple, Peter. 
And the key here is there doesn't seem to be an agenda. Paul doesn't seem to be trying to make a theological point. He just matter-of-factly says he met him. So to me, that's a good indication that uh, we might be dealing with a historical Jesus. Well, now, do, 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 do you know what my historical... pushback is on that? I'm sorry, what? Uh, do you know what my pushback is on that? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, I just didn't want to repeat anything if you already knew it. So the, the thing is, is that that position requires a pretty hefty presumption. Um, the presumption is, is that Paul is referring to a blood relative. The actual words that Paul uses uh, is actually used interchangeably with uh, fraternal uh, 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 kinship. So like the, the word can mean a, a blood relative, but it can also mean this fictive kinship. And I feel like when you add in this aspect that Paul's theology necessitates that all Christians are brothers of the Lord, uh, because he, he states, um, in multiple different verses, I can bring them all up. Uh, if you really want me, want me to, to no, cite no, them I'm, all. I'm very familiar with the argument. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. So, and, so and that's, that's a perspective. I'm sure that could be. Well, my, my, uh, so I've never, uh, and I've speak, I've spoke to a number of experts in this area. I don't know what necessity, like about like how Paul, um, uses like the, the word there and, and, and mentions James. I don't know what makes it to where we have to presume a blood kinship. I, I for me, it's, it's in like, we can't make a conclusion as to whether he was a blood relative or a fictive kinship. I just think that there's more solid arguments on the side of fictive kinship than there is for a blood relative. So I'm in a position of agnosticism, what he actually means. It seems like a lot of historicists that make this argument as if it's like, Oh, this leans in the direction of historicity. Um, they seem to think that the presumption of a blood relation is the one that we should choose. But I've never actually heard a, a coherent argument that convinces me that we should lead in that direction. You know, uh, I, I feel like this, uh, a lot of historicists, uh, lean heavily on this, but interestingly enough, carrier actually counts this as evidence for historicity in his final conclusion of the 33 or one third, uh, chance that Jesus existed in history. Um, he just counts it as very weak evidence. Okay. Um, Here's another general view I, I have. You have this new religion starting out, and what happens? Peter confronts, or Paul confronts Peter and calls him a hypocrite. They have a controversy. Uh, Paul's basically saying, oh my God, yeah, you can eat with the Gentiles you know, behind my back, but you know, when I come, you know, you, you're kind of a hypocrite. So that just strikes me of real verilist similitude that here we're dealing with a real historical event where they're not just trying to get everybody on the same page and acts to a degree gets Paul and Peter on the same page. He does try to iron out some of the differences uh, in their theology, but uh, uh, it's, still, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this, my, my, my that, brain, I'm sorry, my brain wandered off uh, for a moment. Uh, can you um, can you okay, repeat you like what, what part? The, you have the beginning of this new movement, this new mm -hmm. religion, and they're trying to get their ducks in a row. So they go, Peter goes and calls, or Paul calls Peter a hypocrite when he's eating with, the, refusing to eat with the Gentiles. So what I'm saying is it's not like the Book of Mormon. If you read the Book of Mormon, you have, paper thin characters. You have cardboard characters. Everybody's real evil or real good. With this, you have real conflict, a real struggle in the church to go, well, what should the Gentiles do? Should, well, let's just have them uh, you know, do these certain things. I think, you know, not eating uh, blood or whatever, or meat or whatever. And they have, but do you see what I'm saying? That it just right. shows a real conflict, a real, you know, R of historicity. Right. So, um, I, I mean, so, so I, I do want to d distinguish things here. Uh, so first of all, I do think that there was a lot of disagreement between the early Christians about like what the theology should be in some of these more tangential aspects, like the one that you're mentioning here. But I would point Absolutely. out that 
Yeah, I would point out that in Galatians 2, the basic theology of Christianity, Paul says that he was teaching the exact same thing that uh, Cephas or, or Peter and the other apostles were teaching because in Galatians 1, he talks about you know coming to, to Jerusalem, nobody knew him, and he saw James and Peter and all this, uh, you know, these other people. Um, well, not all these other people. It was only Peter and James at the church in, in Jerusalem when he came in Galatians 1. But when he talks about coming back to Jerusalem in Galatians 2, um, he wants to make sure, like the entire purpose is to make sure that he's preaching the same gospel that the other apostles are preaching. And so oh, he comes yeah. back and he says that they added nothing to my theology or they added nothing to my gospel is what he says. And so it makes it seem like the core gospel that they are preaching is the same, but these tangential opinionated aspects to the theology that do not come from Christ himself are the things that they are arguing over. So these tangential opinionated things uh, don't seem to be central to this idea of what the revealed Jesus uh, that Paul describes uh, is talking about. Like it, it, he would have said like, this comes from Jesus if that were the case, but he doesn't that he says that this is my opinion. This has not come from the Lord. Well, he does different. Sometimes he does say this comes from Jesus and he does talk about a last supper and Jesus disciples and certain things about Jesus. But uh, oh, I, I don't think that that's historical, but it might, it might not be, it might not be. But um, here's another thing is, Christians have no clue who Jesus is. They couldn't put Jesus in history if their life depended on it. They do not believe in a real historical Jesus. They believe in their church's view of Jesus, their pastor's view of Jesus. They are totally clueless. And it's hopefully you can go and educate deluded Christians on who their founder really is. Because the Jesus of – here's another good point. You know, the, the criteria of embarrassment, the way we know about uh, whether Jesus was historical is criteria of embarrassment, multiple attestation, which we discussed, and the criterion of dissimilarity. Uh, the embarrassing thing is in Mark 6, remember, Jesus couldn't perform any great miracle. And his brothers say, hey, we got to get this guy out of here. This guy's nuts. So isn't that, to me, why would you put that embarrassing detail? And let's talk about the woman, the Silo well, Phoenician so, so, woman. Uh, who says, so, so, sorry, can we take these one at a time? Says, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, as far as that goes, um, so Mark is a peculiar gospel in that, um, you know, in, in Mark, uh, you know, obviously there's no like birth narrative or anything like that, but that's because Jesus's birth didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was Jesus getting baptized. And then the archangel, uh, that is known as the Messiah, uh, descends from heaven in the form of a dove and inhabits Jesus and wears him, wears his skin, like uh, basically possesses Jesus and, uh, walks around Judea performing all these miracles and everything like that. And then this archangel figure, uh, figure, uh, leaves Jesus, uh, when he, he dies on the cross. And so that's what we're seeing there in Mark. So it makes total sense for Jesus to be a little bit underpowered and like not able to do things because Jesus isn't the son of God, like the literal son of God, like Matthew, Luke, and John would present Jesus as he's just inhabited by an archangel figure. And this is shown by uh, plenty of scholars in the field that the descending dove and everything like that is more Greek mythology. And um, it's supposed to represent like a demigod or a God from uh, you know, the celestial realm descending upon earth and is to be represented by the, the uh, gods of the time. And so like, Given all of this, it makes total sense for in Mark, the earliest gospel, to represent Jesus as a little bit underpowered. And Mark's gospel was more of like a an apostle kind of gospel meant for the apostles to easily be able to teach people about the theology. And so that's why it's so short. But also um, the problem that I have with Mark's gospel is the fact that it doesn't cite any kind of sources or anything like that. So like the fact that we don't have anything for any of this, I mean, it just seems like this uh, is the natural progression of like earthly stories told about Jesus that were created in order to lure members into the cult so that they could then reveal the true mysteries that lie behind the public stories or these historical gospels or well, historical presenting gospels. Well, that's somewhat compelling. And here's the challenge 
is obviously in Luke and Matthew, we have invented contradictory um, birth narratives. And we just have all sorts, obviously it gets ridiculous. I say you just love to use the zombies in Matthew. Even Michael Acona says that's not historical. That's just apocalyptic uh, teachings and whatever. So the challenge is to try to find the real Jesus, to tease out. And one one indication that we might be looking at the real Jesus is the Syrophoenician woman. When she says, Jesus, can you heal me? She reaches out to Jesus. And very believably, Jesus says, why should I give the children, the Jews, the chosen one, their stuff to the dogs? And then she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs. So he seems to be kind of a jerk, kind of a misogynist, um, you know, uh, sort of figure, don't you think? I mean, doesn't that have a ring of historicity? And his xenophobia uh, shows there, too. Why would you well, include let me, that? Let, well, well, can I ask you something? One, does misogyny at that time seem out of place, or does that seem the norm? Well, no, great. No, that, that is a great point. Good point. Yeah. So that yeah. has, but how well, about the so, xenophobia? Right, right. And, and, and so well, that, that actually was pretty well. <laughs> you might be <laughs> destroying my argument as we speak. <laughs> well, uh, so, so uh, th- that's the, <laughs> that's the problem with these criterion of embarrassment sort of uh, claims like, oh, this is an embarrassing fact. So it's got to be historical. How do we, my, my questions are to, typically when I encounter those is one, how do we know that this was actually embarrassing Two, um, how can we know what, you know, the Israelites or the Jews at the time would have considered embarrassing uh, and you know, various forms of that. So like, I don't know that that would have been embarrassing. Like it, it's embarrassing to us now, but obviously it was not embarrassing to like the hundreds of years that uh, Christians controlled the narrative and were able to change things. And we know that they did change things in the gospels when they were embarrassing. Like for example, with the ending of Mark, um, they tacked on like an extended ending to Mark that include like the great commission and uh, a post-resurrection appearance to the disciples. Um, and they did this because it was embarrassing for Mark to not include these things when the other gospels included those things. And so later um, uh, keepers of the gospels, um, they added, you know, that particular thing to uh, accommodate for this embarrassing fact to like dispel the embarrassing fact. So, we definitely know that they were able to change things like in, in it and they actively did. So it seems like if this was an embarrassing fact at the time, then they would have eventually changed it to make Jesus look all pretty, but uh, they didn't, which kind of seems to lend, uh, uh, you know, credence to this idea that it was just a normal thing. Like they didn't see it as misogyny. They, or they rather didn't know what misogyny was. They didn't consider that misogyny was like a bad thing. Uh, well, that, excellent points. Um, but you have other things like when Jesus, he comes and says, Jesus, can I bury my father? And he goes, hey, we got a mission here. You know, let the dead bury their dead. It's like it doesn't really make him seem that attractive. And you do have, you know, the, the Christ, typical Christian apologetic where Peter denies Jesus. And, you, you know, why would you include those details? But yeah, well, So, so if I can touch fault. on that. If I can touch on that, that's more of a commentary on how dipshitty not only Jews were at the time, like because the the entire go- the the gospels, as far as the disciples go, they were a commentary on how bad the Jews were, and adhering to like God's law and adhering to what God wants and all this other stuff. So what you have are are the Jews being terrible at this, and then. Um, you know, stating that, oh, you will deny me three times. One, three is a magical number. Two, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, predicting this is, you know, supposed to be some kind of phenomenal prophetic thing. And then three, um, the denial of it is just supposed to be about how, you know, people will deny him and people will deny Jesus, you know, even if they've met Jesus or they have all this evidence for Jesus, they will deny Jesus. So all of this is like a theological thing. I feel like if we have theological reasons for a story to exist, then there's no way to discern it from actual history. Uh, well, you're right. I mean, there is so much, you know, talk about the post-resurrection appearances. Are you familiar with Dale Allison? Uh, yes. I've, I've tried to get Dale on my show. Or wait, 
maybe it wasn't Dale. Maybe it was James Tabor. One of those two I've tried to get on my show, but they were very reluctant well, about it. <laughs> well, Dale Allison is one of the top five scholars in the world. And he, he's a Christian, but he talks like an atheist. Like we, I asked him about uh, the post-resurrection, the road to Emmaus. He goes, eh, I don't know about that. He goes, <laughs> like, how about the birth narratives? And, go ahead. <laughs> So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was just going to say, I remember Dale Allison, he did a show on Paula Gia's channel and Kip Davis yeah. had a, a, a big problem with the things that, that Dale Allison uh, uh, was saying. And I, I, I emailed Dale Allison to get him on my show and he's like, well, I've already left a comment and everything like that. And also I have these other issues right now, so I can't really come on your show. And so, like, I feel like it's not that he didn't want to come on my show. I just feel like, it, you know, he had a lot of things going on, and he already responded to Kip and everything like that, and maybe sure. he didn't want to, like, exacerbate well, that. So. If you go to Atheist and Christian Book Club, uh, you can see, uh, you know, oh, is that a YouTube he was channel? on our show. And yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You go uh, YouTube, Atheist Christian Book Club, and if you're scrolling up, you'll see uh, Dale Allison or search for it. But it's a great thing, and... One of the problems is everybody's into their own little deal, like the young or old. All they know is the science and the the cosmologists. We had Luke Barnes on, which is actually impacting my faith, uh, who just knows cosmology. But then, or Hugh Ross, who thinks that Daniel was written in the 6th century, just insanity. I mean, everybody knows it was written about 167 B.C., and there's really good reasons to believe that. But back to what I was saying about Dale Allison. So he thinks, hey, grave robbers might be an option here. I don't really like the fish fry at the Sea of God beers. That might be fictional. So he, he being the scholar he is, what's, what we really love about him is he's honest and transparent. He admits the difficulties. I asked him about, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, in Matthew, uh, Judas hangs himself. In Acts, he uh, falls off a cliff. And so the Christians, being so desperate and just cannot stand any contradictions, will say, oh, he, he has the rope broke off the tree and he has got the smoke out. And I asked him, and he goes, well, actually, there's a third one where Pathias says he was ran over by a wheelbarrow. So there's a, again, oh, well, you, know, uh, you have, if you have, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the Papias thing it even gets even more ridiculous with, with, uh, you're talking about Judas, right? Yeah. Yeah. He blows yeah. up and, you know, blows out worms and get his biggest surprise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thing. Like the, the Judas that Papias records is like, he apparently, uh, he, it was, it's comical. Like you would think that you're watching some kind of weird comedy, but like basically Judas, uh, what he, he bloated to the width of, of a, of a street and then, you know, like, uh, worms and all this other disgusting shit, like we're, we're coming out of his orifices and everything like that. And then he died. And so it's like, that's one reason why Bart Ehrman's like, Papias isn't really trusted for any kind of historical information, which I love Bart Ehrman, like his work and everything like that. I, I, I use his work regularly for like my research and like my positions and everything. It, again, just much like Kip Davis on this hyper specific situation, I, I, I typically disagree with him on like the historicity of Jesus and, and like Christian origins and stuff. Well, and here's the layman's dilemma. It's like, who do we trust? I mean, mm -hmm. now, uh, Richard Carrier, <laughs> Richard Carrier is not a new Testament, uh, scholar and there's not many of them, new textual critics. So, you know, we have to put our confidence in somebody. You know, and well, that's so, one of the so problems. It, and we have. If I could say, uh, while Richard Carrier isn't a New Testament scholar, he is an expert. Like specifically, he studied and he presented his dissertation on um, on the first century Roman history. So, like for sure. this time period, and he's for, a real deal. He's a real PhD from a real university. Absolutely. Oh yeah. I just wanted to make sure that it was, it was clear that like he is an expert in the field, but just maybe not new Testament history as far as like, or not history, but new Testament studies. Like he doesn't have a new Testament studies degree, but he definitely has a relevant uh, degree in this particular area. So he can tell us exactly what uh, was going on. And there, there are people dropping off in the call in queue and I, I'm, oh. I'm really sorry about okay, that. Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, hey, no. This is it's great. okay. Uh, nice to meet you finally and say hello. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, and just so you know, I did put a link uh, for everybody. Like I, I did an at and then the name and everything so people can get to the Christian uh, or Atheist and Christian Book Club. I put that in the oh, description. Oh, by the way, we did have we did have Bart Ehrman on too, so you can see our yeah. interview with Bart Ehrman. That, hey, that's great. Like no, no you. problem. I, I feel like everybody, if, if people are interested in this topic and, and interested in religion in general, they should definitely check out like the eighth, uh, your channel, the Christian and Atheist Book Club. I, I think that that's well, and I would uh, love fabulous. To, I, I would love to be on your show. I've been on Gabba's Grammy uh, show, uh, Kelly's show, numerous times, and uh, it's, it's always fun. All right, thanks. I know you got other callers. Oh, uh, okay. Bye. It was great talking to you, and uh, I hope you have a great night, okay? Same here. Thanks. Well, that was an awesome call, and I'm so glad that Bill called in today. I would like to know how reliable you think the sources for Jesus are, and specifically the sources for the gospel. What do you think about James, the brother of the Lord? Was he just a fictive kinship, just another Christian, or was he a blood relation to Jesus? And then finally, do you find the historical methodology generally surrounding Jesus to be rather cherry-picked and at some times created specifically for the historical Jesus? Let me know down below in the comments and while you're down there why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content and don't forget to stand up and use your voice bye heathens